Welcome back to Zero Books and Repeater Media. I am Craig, the host of the Acid Horizon podcast. And today with us, we have Matthew Ingram, who is the author of the recently released book, Retreat, How the Counterculture Invented Wellness, out now on Repeater Books. Retreat indexes a plethora of countercultural trends from the late 60s onwards and endeavors to show how these trends ultimately impacted what we understand as wellness or wellness culture today. The work covers everything from the beat poets to the psychedelics of Stanislav Grof and the anti-psychiatry movement spearheaded by the likes of Artie Lang. As we take a look at some of the vignettes in the book, we'll also talk about some of the political implications of these movements in their time and as they linger today. Matthew, welcome to the show today. Thanks very much for having me on board, Craig. Let's just begin with a, a little bit of an introduction to you and this work. How did you get interested in this area of research and what was the process that brought about this book? Well, I had made a film previously about vitamin C and my background has always been the counterculture and music journalism. And I noticed a whole raft of sort of health methodologies that had clustered around the counterculture and no one had put them together. And so I pieced all of these strands together. And so uh, it was an opportunity to talk about macrobiotic food and psychedelics and anti-psychiatry uh, all in one go, go. And it was interesting because it produced a whole lot of uh, connections and synergies that weren't obvious before to me. Great. So this book attempts to show how counterculture led to the wellness industry, and you do so by providing numerous vignettes of various movements. Could you say a little bit how you see the continuity from counterculture to wellness culture today? And could you perhaps highlight what you think are some of the general political implications that have ensued? Sure. It's not a straightforward connection. And in fact, I should probably point out that when I first pitched the book to the publishers, my title was health and the counterculture, but it was a bit dry. And so we all went back and thought, thought about it. And then I suggested, well, look, if we talk about wellness, then we can make a bridge to, you know, what people understand now as a sort of cultural form of, of health. But, you know, there's obviously strands like obviously with meditation and with psychedelics that people could see a connection to, and obviously with vegan food as well, which is very close to macrobiotics, but in the history of it, what happened was that the initial promise of the counterculture, as it, as it was originally arranged, got to about 1975. And then there was a big change in how those methodologies and techniques were, were used in the mm. culture. So, so a lot of things became watered down. A lot of things became adopted and admitted in a Western way mainly. And it's not a straightforward journey. And in fact, one of the arguments that I, I make in the book is that one of the kind of the ethical promise that the counterculture dreamed of went by the wayside, but the, the, but, but then again, you know, some of those ideas became more durable and, and but there's a big shift in emphasis from what I would term techniques of ego dissolution. Which, mm. which runs right through the psychedelics, the meditation, mm. that becomes much more tempered in wellness, probably for the best, because as we all know, the aftermath of the 60s and, and the counterculture was very messy. Mm. A lot of that had to do with, with ego dissolution. In terms of politics, it's, it's regarded detrimentally nowadays. But there's there sort of outlier approaches that have tried to look at you know, the more radical aspects that psychedelics and what have a present, but you know, that, 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 that works like the century of the self, Adam Curtis's film made a very bad case for what was actually happening. And I think maybe that's something we could come back to later, but sure. I think it was an unnecessarily negative view mm -hmm. of, 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 of a sort of narcissistic approach that people were taking that was apolitical in, in, in their view. Now, after having read a bit of the book and you know, I, I made in my questions, as you saw, I, I made connections to both Adam Curtis and Mark Fisher, who I, I think kind of, you know, relative to your work represent uh, opposing sides of the spectrum. I, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a kind of optimism that Mark Fisher has about the recovery of counterculture 
And as you said, you know, there's a, almost a complete pessimism maintained by Adam Curtis as he sees this attempt from the late 60s and early 70s, you know, in the creation of communes and this idea of an independent collectivism then condenses into the sort of cult of the self that we might see, you know, in the cultures that spring up around Esalen and, and Fritz Perls and, and that sort of thing. Maybe, maybe you can talk about that configuration, the, this trifecta of your work, Mark Fisher's work or Adam Curtis's work, like where do you see yourself, you know, in the sort of range of opinions and views that people have sure. about counterculture? I mean, obviously I'm a very, I'm a very small voice in, in comparison yeah. to those two, but I know that I share with Mark, who was a, a, a friend of mine and who I mm -hmm. set the forum dissensors up with, we both shared a perspective that came from essentially music journalism and the, the background, the sort of the subtext to a lot of the, the, the music and the music journalism and the understandings of critics was fundamentally countercultural. So, so that was almost like the seedbed that we both emerged from. So I think we would both, I, I, I would share with Mark having a sort of a, you know, a tremendous fondness for those ideas and, and those ideas that were essentially in, enshrined in the radical music that we loved, you know, and the, the marks, the, the promise that Marx saw in rave and what have you very much were about the, uh, that, that's, that's countercultural spirit springing to life again in, in the nineties. And so I think where I, I would differ from Mark is that I guess I come from, you know, sort of, a, it's kind of an admission, but it's, it's more as like a sort of hardcore mystical perspective whereby I think a lot of the trajectories out of the counterculture went into Eastern philosophy. I mean, it, it, you know, in my writing, I've sort of argued that, that that's what the counterculture was. It was those ideas coming to the West. And so, you know, I, I tend to view, take a very sort of long view on psychedelics, which is that, you know, it's almost like the first stage of a sort of a development and that, you know, that Although they reveal certain psychedelics, re reveal certain things, and those things are, you know, implicit. I know in, in philosophy or Plato or even Deleuze, those right. ideas are that, and that we shouldn't really need psychedelics to, to explore them. So anyway, that that's that was a perspective I took right. to um, writing retreat, and I I know that I, I bummed quite a lot of psychedelics users out by by taking that angle, which wasn't entirely supportive of psychedelics. And so I think Mark and I sort of basically, I came from a, come from a relatively similar position to Mark, which is seeing that the promise of that, but, but, but being a bit of a downer by, by, by not imagining it as something that those are states of mind that, you know, can be maintained through psychedelics. And on the other hand, Adam Curtis, I, I nearly called him Richard Curtis there for a second, and the century of the self. I mean, that I view very much in, in historical terms. I mean, the, the first. I mean, the, the anti-psychiatric run, you know, had, had an absolute storming run up till about 1971. And that argument politically as well was extremely powerful. And I think it took a long time for the establishment to figure out a, a solid response to it. And that response to me, the earliest, the earliest thing was, I think, an article by well, not the, uh, not the first, but one of the earliest well-known things was an article by a, a man called Peter Marin, who was a, who wrote about Trungpa, the guru, the Buddhist guru in Boulder, mm -hmm. a very strong critique of Trungpa. And he wrote a, an article called The New Narcissism about Esalen mm -hmm. and, in 1975. And that was the first blow to this idea and of how these healing methodologies could be ethical or, or constructive or politically aware. Then that was followed by Tom Wolfe's article in 1976, which was a big, huge sort of culture defining article, which is the me decade, which right. is when it really hit the mainstream, this idea that to behave like this, or to, to, to be interested in all these, you know, Eastern ideas of you know, all the, the sort of self-help methodologies was you know, narcissistic. And then obviously in 1979, Christopher Lash with the culture of narcissism, basically I, I haven't seen Lash having any great ideas at all. It's almost like he took the me decade and thought, okay, this is going to sell some books. And that was massive. And 
I, you know, I, I don't want to be, you know, because it's said to yourself is great and there's lots of wonderful footage and it's very entertaining, but it takes the argument of those people and just writes it up. It doesn't have, it doesn't have any, any idea whatsoever of the background. Mm. It's full of inaccuracies about, you know, as is the Tom Wolf about the actual yeah. nature of the thing, as well as sort of journalistic inaccuracies. And, you know, Adam Wolf takes that and, you know, confuses Freudianism with neo-Freudianism. And it just, it's basically a sort of death sentence for, for wellness that, you know, critical thinking doesn't seem to have really overcome. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's how I stand on, on, on those two. So maybe I'll step back for a moment and just try to frame all of the particulars that are in the discussion right now. So, you know, Will and I were talking a little bit before the show, you know, about the work that's involved here. And I, I think some of these debates rage on a bit today. The way that we see it is there's this sort of opposition between, and, and you get this a bit with Artie Lang and Deleuze and Gattari, between the idea of whether this idea of desubjectivation or depersonalization is radical and whether one can go too far in doing so, or if this has anything to do with liberatory politics at all. Here I'm thinking of, you know, folks in the Christopher Lash camp and, and so forth. One of the other axes that intersects with this is whether, you know, whether or not any of these practices were revolutionary in any tangible sense. Most traditional Marxists would say no, because it didn't eventuate in any sort of overthrow of capitalism, for example. Yet these were, in the sort of Deleuze and Gattari sense, lines of flight, ways of escaping capital, which had this, you know, and continues to have a seemingly insurmountable speed. So the question of whether or not these things are effective is perhaps outstripped by the notion that capital has just been too fast for everything. And so maybe these things, in some sense, were effective in their particularity, in their temporality. Maybe you can just respond to my framing of that. Sure. I, I guess I come from neither a philosophical background or critical theory background in, in the sense that I really kind of, I sort of see myself, so this might sound a bit pretentious, but I, I see myself more like a, essentially a journalist, as like a social historian. And so I, I, equally, I, I don't tend to take a political angle because political angle, because it's just, you know, I, I one level, I'm just completely out of my depth, mm. but I tend to, to see it as a, I definitely, you know, to, to answer your question in a very sort of straightforward way. Yes. I think all of these techniques are valuable. And, but I think one might, might well, these techniques of, I think, as you put it, depersonalization, I would, I would okay. say, you know, ego dissolution. I think we, we made the same thing there. Mm -hmm. I think that they, they're, they're definitely valuable, but I think it tends to fall within, you know, a background of spiritualities. And it's whether, you know, I think those are, you know, Buddhism or Hinduism or, you know, Jainism or, or have you, those are the, the perspective on, on which they stand or fall. I definitely think that, I mean, on the one hand, there are these, there are the arguments about wellness that you, you're, you're laying the, you're, you're laying the, the impetus to heal upon the individual where it should be the state, you know, that should be helping people, which is obviously a, a political angle, you know, and it, it, in um, researching retreat, you know, what I came across the, the socialist patient collective, the SPK, who, who take very extreme position on that angle, Wolfgang Huber takes a view that, you know, that the state causes schizophrenia. So the state is, you know, the, the actor in that. And then you could compare that, you know, within you know, Hindu thought with something like a statement like. Mahesh Marishi yogis who, who, who would say that for a forest to be green, each tree must be green. So, you know, how do you reconcile that, those two positions? I mean, mm. and my, my view, it, you know, just in terms of, of someone who's researched wellness and health is that, and, and this was the kind of conclusion I walked away with having done the research for retreat is that pain is the message you know, your suffering is, is the message. And, you know, if you listen to that message and really, you know, question it and, 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 and think through it, you're, 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 you're going to make a, you're going to make, you are going to obviously going to, not necessarily, if you, if you get it right, I believe you, you'll, 
you'll find a solution to your, your health problems, mm. but you're also going to be by default creating a, a better environment, a better environment around you and a better environment in the world. So, so, so that's my view, which is kind of like very, very old school sixties perspective. I mean, that's what all of the old sixties dudes and, 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 and women that I went to speak to mm. came up with. And I, I, I still think that that's, you know, I don't think that that's a cop out because I think it places a lot of, I think it has a lot to offer the individual as well as, you know, society. Maybe we can talk about the anti-psychiatry movement I mean, because I think the way that you develop the the story of R.D. Lang is important not only in the book, but I think, you know, for this area of research in general, because in so many ways, I think his story encapsulates both the set of positive and negative consequences of the kinds of experimental thinking and research that had mm. cropped up around this time. I'm not going to assume that the listeners know very much about Artie Lang. So could you just give us a sort of summary of his life and work and maybe, maybe even the way that you kind of take us through that work in retreat? Sure. Artie Lang was a Glasgow born. He, he was originally a, you know, a medical psychiatric doctor and he went through he'd done he'd had done worked in asylums in scotland you know in the 50s but i think it was his experience working as a psychiatrist in the army when he was routinely having routinely having to do frontal lobotomies and ect electric shock treatment to patients that he's sharpened his thinking about treatment and, and this was obviously a very dark era for the, you know, the psych, the psychiatry, I, th I think that, you know, drugs like chlorpromazine had become to it, had, had, were just starting to be introduced, which, which were going to have a positive effect, but actually let which, the positive effect would, would tail off actually probably towards the middle of middle of his career. The scenario, if you can imagine it is, is of one with the popular one, which people will probably understand and remember is, is one flew over the cuckoo's nest. Mm. And this idea of a psychiatric institution that is basically trying to solve problems that have on some level have a psychoanalytic basis and Ardy Lang's position essentially was a hardening of, of, of Jung's position, mm -hmm. Jung, the, 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 uh, the Swiss psychoanalyst or pioneer of psychoanalysis and his idea was, could be sum summarized as break break through, not break down. So that the, mm -hmm. the, the idea was that the, the patient, that the, the, what mental illness manifested, what, what, what was a manifestation of a damaged or corrupt ego. So basically where the ego was leaking in elements of the psychology, the subconscious mm -hmm. in a random and, and confused way. And that what needed to happen was essentially this breakthrough. So a sort of fissile meltdown of the ego, which would eventually reform it. And this is what Jung's idea of individuation is, which is that through the process of psychoanalysis, you break your, you, you break your ego down and then it reforms into a healthy position. So, so this is what Ardy Lang took into the sixties. He wrote a book in 1960 called the divided cell, which was massive and very popular, very trendy in, indeed. And it had a currency, which was partly owing to the fact that he also referred to a lot of cultural things. He, he talked about Shakespeare. He talked about the Searle. He talked about, you know, Heidegger. He, he was a, an incredibly voracious intellectual and, and that separates him from the mainstream of medical thought, which is very much about, you know, medical solutions. He was a thinker. He shares that with Freud. In fact, Freud, again, leapfrogged out of the, the context of the medical right, because he, Freud was writing about Plato. That's the Ali Lang's background. Now, unfortunately, what, what happened was that the critique around Ali Lang was that his work came at an iteration at a time at the tail end of chloropromazine, which was the drug that basically emptied the asylums. It was a total revolution, dopamine antagonist, 
antihistamine that meant that suddenly people who'd been locked up for life were able to go on the back, were released back into society. But towards the end, there became a problem with something called tardo dyskinesia, which is where patients have, you know, seizures. So at that point, it was, it was like people were seeing the problems with it, but then people, and then quite soon after Lang, there was a new drug that was introduced called flufenazine that was again was effective. So the argument is historical in medical historical terms it, that Lang came between these two interactions. There, his popularity was a result of this lull in psychiatric solutions. However, I, I think that, and, and a lot, I spoke to his contemporaries. Some of them were spoke very fondly of him. Some of them were very critical of him, that he, saying that he just didn't understand what bipolar meant. He didn't understand that. He, he thought that the, the what, what Joseph Neumann called the dragon journey, he thought that that was a sort of individuation when in fact it was just one way station on the bipolar arc. But I mean, I, I think that's, that's harsh. And my own view is that the individuation, it, it, although it's, I don't think it's probably measured as such, or I don't think they can measure it just as yet. But I think innovation, individuation or the, that kind of journey is probably a, a psychiatric event in itself. And so you know, I think that there is hope, sort of post, post Langium, not that I know that anybody's ever concerned about it. And all the emphasis is on medication these days, which isn't, you know, well and good, but I, I think there was something there in, in Lang's ideas. There is an interesting story that you recounted in retreat that maybe you can talk about and that the prospect of R.D. Lang working with Pink Floyd's Sid Barrett. And I hadn't heard that before. Maybe you could say a bit about that. No, I was, I was, I was amazed and delighted to, to be able to, because it was a great way of talking about Sid and that climate of the time where, you know, it was almost expected that people would behave in a sort of offbeat way. I think mm -hmm. that there's a number of commentaries that say Rob Chapman who interviewed a number of people who said that, you know, it was like, you know, he's, it was fine. You know, he was a bit mad. It was okay. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that, that, I think that idea persisted for a long time, well into the eighties that, you know, it was much more normal for people to behave in an eccentric way. You know, you would say about someone, ah, he's crazy. He, you don't say that anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it's sort of, you know, it's much more people talk about their emotional psychiatric problems. They don't. But anyway, R.D. Lang, one of his, one of Sid's friends, a guy called Gale, tried to get Sid to R.D. Lang and actually booked an appointment. And Lang's told David Gale that Sid had to want to come to therapy. And R.D. Lang, in fact, was at, at that point in time, his therapy involved giving people large amounts of acid. So yeah. actually that was Sid's problem, really. Not <laughs> really. Might not have been the answer. But the day came and I think they, they booked a cab outside and said, oh, Sid, there's a cab outside. So how would you fancy you going around to see R.D. Lang? And I think Barrett just, just wasn't interested. But it's one of those funny, like, you know, when the giants meet sort of scenarios. And maybe just to sort of wrap up the, the discussion of R.D. Lang, I was recently reading a portion of the biography of the bassist Jaco Pastorius. There's this kind of unusual synergy or I, I would say overlap or comparison that we can make between their lives. I, I, I mean, Lang almost had a rock star status, literally, but you know, almost hanging out with the likes of Sid Barrett. But later in his career, as you point out, it seems that he became enamored with this sort of, you know, this heroic mythology about himself. And he got caught in that imaginary to the extent that he went on essentially pilgrimages to the, the Near East to engage in ascetic practices and so forth. And then later on, he kind of, you know, fell off into obscurity. Maybe you could talk about the end of Artie Lang's life and, and how yes. it impacted his legacy. Well, yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sad, it's a very unusual story in that it peaks very spectacularly at the end of the, end of the 60s. And then you know, sort of dribbles away. Um, but, but what happened was uh, I, I actually, I think that I, I think that Lang, he, he went to Sri Lanka to study with a Buddhist Vipassana teacher called Kathera, who wrote a very famous book 
on meditation, which was like the first book that a lot of people came across. It's all translations of, of, of early Pali meditation information. Uh, and I actually think that Lang, I have kind of faith in, in that, the Lang of, of that era. Mm-hmm. I think he came back to the UK in, I think, 1971 to massive debt. So I don't think he realized what his, his tax situation was. And I think that, I think a lot of people went through a kind of a high at the end of the sixties. And you hear him talking at the conference of liberation of dialectics. He's, he's absolutely the height of in what Jung would call inflation. Yeah. And I think that the, 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 the inflation is a good model for talking about a lot of the sixties through figures, which I said he, he, he managed to. Which is that Jung, Jung would say, oh, he's mistaking the God within him for, for his own divinity. Uh, mm-hmm. So Jung would say that, you know, that confusion that a, lo- a lot of them had. He then became, he, he diverse, he wrote books on poetry, he wrote a book called Knots, which mm-hmm. is actually not bad. It's actually kind of like sort of, psychi- sort of psychoanalytical koans about mental situations about sort of a lot of them relating to what Gregory Bateson called the double bind situation. You know, mm-hmm. somebody says this, somebody says this, somebody says this. And I think it's, and I think, but I think really what it did for him is that there's the fate of a lot of people who took a lot of LSD was that he started drinking a lot. He basically mm-hmm. became an alcoholic mm-hmm. and it happens to so many of the big, it happens to most tragically it happens to Alan Watts who started out as a very kind of quite upright, but eccentric Zen teacher, was turned onto LSD by Timothy Leary, and then becomes an alcoholic. And I think it's, I tend to think of alcohol as a, essentially quite an integrative, integrative, integral drug. It's quite grounding in a sense. And I think that, you know, when you destroyed your ego to that extent, I think that it can actually bring people to quite a sort of somatic, physical, Relationship. It's obviously a, there's a lot to lose in in, in that situation. Mm. Writing the music book again, I, I came across an interview with Marky e. Smith of The Fool, who took a lot of acid for on um, mushrooms for a very long time, and then talked about he drinking away his psychic powers. He said he mm. used to be psychic, but he drank away, drank it away. And I think that that's what happened to Lang. He just drank. He lost his he lost his medical license, and died of a heart attack playing tennis. Yeah. A cautionary tale for all the drinkers out there. I just came back from the UK, so that goes double for you guys. Yeah, I, I want to bring Will into the conversation. Maybe the way we can do that is to talk about the connection, the way that you write a little bit about Deleuze and Deleuze and Gattari, and Deleuze and Gattari's connection to the work of Artie Lang, because in as much as they, they see Lang as a, a kind of pioneer of sorts, of the anti-medicalization of schizophrenia. There are things that they do in anti-Oedipus, and then there's things that they do in A Thousand Plateaus later on that we could call, you know, sort of different movements in, in this project of developing a politics of desubjectivation. What's your take on Deleuze and Gattari with respect to Artie Lang? Well, again, I, I have to sort of take be quite humble in the sense that I, I, I did read a certain amount of philosophy reading retreat, but I, I'm just not on your level, uh, sure. either of your levels. So, but what I, I read, I picked up Anti-Oedipus and A Thousand Plateaus in the nineties. And I think I sort of probably read a couple of chapters, but I came back to them after having read retreat and was just struck by just how much it was an encoding of the ego dissolution ideas of the counterculture. They liberally name drop. I mean, it's fun. I'm glad that they, they do it, Deleuze and Guattari. But, you know, the, the people that they mention are the exact, you know, pantheon of the countercultural hero. So, so Lang is someone who's, who's mentioned a lot. I was like, oh, right, okay, I get it. So I understand where they're coming from. And, and it seemed to me, as well, and I, I read some writing about Deleuze Buddhism and Deleuze and the Vedanta, and it very much seems like a a sort of Vedic or Buddhist philosophy or, or, or repurposing of those ideas. The body without organs, 
I think there's a there's an interesting piece by a, an Indian academic called Meena Gupta. I, I, it's it's she's not the first I know to to mention it, but right. it, it very much has the same properties that the Vedic concept of Brahman, and and you can sim, summarize, summarize that very very simply uh, for sort of lay people because I know Dulles is very complicated, but that the the I, that idea is that what is the ego consciousness is a fragment of consciousness itself. The analogy that's often used in, in, in Indian thought is of the air and the, the ego is like the air in a bottle and you, you know, perhaps with a cork on, and then you take the, the cork off and then it's, it's contiguous w w w with the air in the world. And, and the, the body without organs is, has a very much a property of the Brahman, which is mm. The consciousness at large. I think actually that's, I, I haven't heard that before, but I really like that image to describe the body without organs. When we get to a thousand plateaus, and, and we have to know that, you know, the concept of a body without organs traverses Deleuze's work from his early work, Proust and Signs, to yes. Logic of Sense. I think it gets its strongest treatment when he, he works with Gatari. But one of the ways that they discuss it in the, the plateau called how do you make yourself a body without organs is that the process of creating oneself as a body without organs means it, it's a process of what they call creative involution. That in any given instance, there's a sort of predominant logic or algorithm or axiom that organizes all the components of who we are in some way. And so in the case of a bottle, right? There's something inside the bottle that, you know, is a component of the larger reality, which would be the air outside. And it's by getting outside that bottle that that air inside can then connect with these other intensities. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that might not be perhaps my go to model for explaining the body without organs, but we can think about it in terms of sort of deactivating this organizing element so mm -hmm. that those intensities that are bound up underneath the organization can find the more enlivening ones and escapes around it. And yes. this wasn't simply meant as a, an operation on the singular individual self. Deleuze and Gattari saw this as a broader political operation. And I think this is where sometimes people get confused or maybe they get off the, they, they get a sense that Deleuze and Gattari, maybe they're doing something a little bit hippy dippy. Deleuze and Gattari are speaking to the radicals of, you know, the post-68 era. Their work then speaks later to the movements in Italy and so forth. And what they're trying to do is create this convergence between this attempt at evolving consciousness or creating a, a sort of desubjectivated political subject, one who resists normalizing forces, one who resists the imposition of ideologies and the desire that capitalism creates and so forth. And so, you know, Will's actually a very good one to talk about this. So maybe, Will, this is a good time for you to come in. Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's quite interesting to discuss Deleuze and Guattari's relationship to Artie Lang in as much as Guattari himself actually wrote a pretty, pretty famous work on, the, div on divi the divided Artie Lang, where he plays on Lang's ontological insistence, you know, in evading i mean there are also other things that are primarily related to to guattari's reading of of lacan and the freudian tradition but one of the one of the areas where guattari and and also foucault find themselves in kind of conflict with Artie lang is that lang's interest in in alternative medicine is interested in as much as it still maintains the entire structure of the clinic so like for for R.D. Lang, you know, he may problematize a particular treatment in the history of psychiatry, right? Whether that be electroshock therapy, the utilization of downers and frontal lobotomies. Interestingly enough, when Foucault in the 50s was working as a psychology student, one of the sort of traumatic events in his life was, you know, becoming friendly with a with a patient who would then be subject to a, to a partial frontal lobotomy. So it seems to have been sort of a universal experience for individuals who, I mean, Foucault's not necessarily a part of the anti-psychiatry movement in the way in which we understand the term in the United States and the UK. But that seems to, the violence of the clinic seems to be a very important and informative element to to these thinkers. 
But one of the things that that they maintain a sort of ambivalence about with R.D. Lang is, in fact, a certain element of his relationship to what Foucault would call psychiatric power or dis- mm. or what would become disciplinary power in 1975. You're quite right in the sense that he wasn't all in with anti-psychiatry. He actually, he actually was unhappy about being called an anti-psychiatrist. He, he always wanted to be a practicing psychiatrist. And, and in fact, a lot of the critiques like a- Avram Hoffer wrote that, you know, he should burn his, if he's going to say these things, he should, he should tear up his, his medical documents. But the, 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 the really stringent anti-psychiatrist, David Cooper, who set up a, a clinic called Ward 21 and was also very important with Lang in setting up Kingsley Hall. There was the idea there that they, they take it out of the clinic. But I haven't read the Qatari, so I, I'm just not comment. I'm just not. But you are right in the sense that he was not committed enough, essentially. And he, he wasn't, he was always going to be a doctor and he was always going to be a psychiatrist. So, so that is correct. Yeah. Yeah. And it, and it shows a, a kind of, because I think one of the, one of the other sort of elements that makes the passage from, from Lang to Deleuze, kind of a difficult one to track, is explicitly the fact that Deleuze and Guattari are responding to, to events surrounding 1968. 68, yeah. Right. Because, you know, in a, in a certain sense, these were, you know, whether it's, whether it's the, the street fights of 68 or the revolt and the near revolution in Italy in 76, really, to 78, with, um, the Red Army faction and the the Aprismo and autonomous and post autonomous workerist mm-hmm. movements. You know these they're they're attempting to speak to a politics that tends towards the individual. So I think what Deleuze would would say, and what would end up being probably one of his most fundamental contributions to political philosophy in his life, probably the most important essay ever. Maybe Craig and I can fight about the importance of it to Deleuze himself. But the the essay, The Control Society, Postscripts on the Society of, of Control or Societies of Control, where Deleuze presents a kind of picture of, of what would become kind of cemented as neoliberal capitalism retrospectively in understanding, you know, the post-Carter economy and Reaganomics would be that it tends towards, and this is true, I think, too, for Foucault in the disciplinary society, is that it relies on a perpetual interplay between desubjectivation and resubjectivation, right? So Foucault's response and Deleuze's response to someone who says like, oh, desubjectivation is impossible, you know, they would probably just say, just ask the drill sergeant who does it for a living, right? Who breaks individuals down and is tasked with reconstructing them. And I, I, I you know, I think that the the question of desubjectivation in politics for these thinkers is not one without fundamental risk and in fact for them this this interplay between desubjectivation and resubjectivation is the territory of contemporary political development that it's not necessarily through just through molar divisions that we find the battle lines of political struggle forming it's between it's down ver- subjects themselves at all instances they're constantly being subject to this sort of bipolar process i guess bipolar is not the right word and maybe maybe craig can can elucidate on it a little bit but one thing that i find kind of interesting about the position on on Lang, and I didn't know that story about I didn't know that story about Sid Barrett, which I think is really telling too, is that Lang in a certain sense wants to maintain while while establishing a kind of fundamental opposition to the practices of of the clinic, he still wants to maintain the very treatment structure and problematization of yeah. It's definitely uh, true. It's definitely yeah. true. To talk about 1968 and Deleuze and Guattari, you know, what's interesting is, is in 67, to the Conference of Dialectics, Liberation of Dialectics, David Cooper, at the end of his 
speech, he actually said he was looking forward to hearing the compassionate chatter of machine guns over North London. And he asked for people after the conference, he asked for revolutionaries to come and meet him after the conference. He was actually threatening to organize it. And, and Kingsley Hall, although Lang was involved in it, which was a kind of a community mental health scenario, which is again, again, not in the clinic. The guy who's really involved in that was, was Joseph Burke, who, who, who would have identified willingly as, a, as an anti-psychiatrist. And he went on to form an organization called Arbors, which was all about so basically safe houses in the community that people would go and live. People with mental health issues would live in the house and there would be visiting to often trainee psychoanalysts, psychoanalysts visiting them. So he also had a vision of it outside the clinic, but it's, it's absolutely with, with Lang is a criticism. He wanted everything. He wanted to be, he wanted to be a rebel and he wanted to be, to get paid and to be part of the establishment at the same time. You know, And, and what also seems interesting is that one of the kind of insurmountable positions of at least in the way in which we understand and the spk talks about this too in turn illness into a weapon is the immediate relationship between the identification of mental illness and sectioning right in new york right now what we're seeing is the reinstantiation of a whole bunch of city ordinances from really from the 80s, that give police basically the carte blanche capacity to, yeah. to determine whether or not an individual they come across who is, is homeless needs to be, essentially needs to be incarcerated. So I, I, I think that one of, one of, the, interesting, one of the interesting elements of, of that period, and one of the, the things that I think Deleuze, Foucault, and Lang to an extent, are are working on is trying to articulate the cohabitation of the cohabitation of a particular relationship to a kind of knowledge right and the way in which that knowledge functions in accordance to the carceral system and it, and it i think it remains it remains sort of one of the one of the crucial tasks for for individuals sort of embroiled in this philosophical this philosophical and and intellectual history if it can if it can sort of be reduced to that because i'm not so sure it can be right i don't think Deleuze and Guattari and Foucault are possible in the way that we understand them without 1968 each for different reasons and for lang i think it's it's the i don't think lang is possible without the, you know the movements of found you know in founded in Tuch and Pinel, right? And nineteenth century psychiatry and Lang's reading of Heidegger, you know Lang's exposure to Dasein analysis really begins to color the divided self, right? The 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 constant references to Diltai, Husserl, Heidegger, and eventually Sartre, you know, later on in that text. So it it seems like there's this kind of collision course in the and maybe this is something you can. You could speak to because this is more a historical question, but when at, at what point do we start to see the the sort of dissipation or the divergence of what we would call like in the '60s and what we still pretty much practice today, which is ego psychology? When do we start to see the sort of divergence between philosophical movements that had an interest in anti psychiatry for different reasons than maybe the anti psychiatrists had an interest in anti psychiatry mm -hmm. and those individuals who were you know dealing with these questions at the level of uh, on a day to day med practical yeah. medical level yeah well I think probably one of the first points would be the introduction of you know the new second wave of anti psychotic medications when you know the philosophy becomes, you know, meaningless on a day-to-day -day level. I mean, you can, you can say like Deleuze and Guattari do, you know, that, you know, a schizophrenic going out for a walk is, is better than, you know, somebody in, in therapy or, or subdued. But I think, I think that, so, so that is, that's, that's a, a good point at which you could point to the, the difference of the time, but I think that 
Lang was Lang, and certainly was was intellectually. He was an he was a he was in a very unusual. He was a kind of one off. So I think it's sort of almost almost himself. He, he's splintering off from from the mainstream. So I think it's uh, although those ideas, you know, were, were things that people would talk about and had a sort of cultural currency. I think almost immediately, they were problematic. I mean, just in terms of use of LSD as a as a therapeutic tool, you know, Osmond and Hoffer. You know that they they wanted to cure LSD, alcoholics with LSD, but you know they no evidence. They couldn't produce any evidence from the Susquehanna Clinic when everybody went and looked at the, the of of that concept of those concepts as working in in you know the kind of ego dissolution concept as working in a psychiatric environment. So and, you know, and in a, in a certain sense too, I think LSD speaks to to something else that is kind of strange is that what we find in the history of at least 18th and what would become psychiatry really in the mid 19th century with the the movements surrounding escrow and then would culminate in sort of the work of Kraepelin and Francois Loray and I think they they get nodded to in in the divided self at least Kraepelin's patient does he, he I know he liked Endel Kraepelin yes yeah what what what's interesting with the the utilization of LSD in 1968, and maybe I'll sound sort of silly in talking about this, but <laughs> LSD sure. experimentation was yeah. was fundamental to like MK Ultra programs, as we would as we yeah. as we would learn twenty years later. I don't uh, think that the two there's a contradictory. You know, I think that's the thing is that there's there's almost no contradiction. Yeah, in some respects. And I, I wonder if Lang's final interest in in LSD sort of indicates his kind of thing reliance on the need for for a sort of perhaps a kind of a psychobiological intervention at a certain level in yeah. in his medicine that he would like to take out of the clinic, but in a certain way he can't do. Like he's divided against himself in that yeah. moment, and I wonder if. The utilization of of LSD in a in a sort of controlled therapeutic sense, you know, because also like LSD plays an important role in resistance movements too, that are entirely outside of and the and the criminalization of LSD in in the late in the early seventies is and it plays a fundamental role in the drug war in its earliest in its basically its infancy. I you know it it seems to me that 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 LSD finds itself proliferated in all of these different in all of these different spaces whether they be you know the most crude elementary understandings of like of punitive practices right the idea that possibly we could use this in some form of interrogation right and it never really pans out there was there was the whole thing with lsd which was basically it was so powerful that it was like wow this is great you know what can we use this for and they were all i mean even Osmond and Hofer went through about three ideas about what they could use it for before the, the you know before they actually settled on massive doses to cure alcoholics, what they called psychedelic ther therapy. But no, it was you know there was a, a whole series of, of people thinking, what the hell can we do with this? Yeah, and it's also important to like the California cult of the self, right? The one that. You know, Foucault will will lecture in California, and he's this is at the point when he's talking about the concept in in Greek philosophy of the epimelea heo two, which is, in the end of his his life, he he finds himself kind of interested in in the interplay between knowledge and subjectivity, and he's going to argue that the nothi seoton, which is the know thyself, right, in the reception of Western philosophy. It covers over another element of of Platonist and Epicurean and even cynic thought of the the care of the self. And one of the students asks, like, "Oh, is this is this like the care of the self in California?" And Foucault starts laughing because, like, it, it, it there's nothing there's nothing more foreign to the Epimeliaio too than the California cult of the self or the California self-care culture, which also seems now to have a particular relationship with all of these, a sort of Orientalist relationship, which I think is inseparable from like 
European imperialism too, and the domination of particular particular forms of of knowledge and 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 uh, philosophical discourse, right? Can you can you speak to at all, sort of the the relationship between between self care culture and because that seems to be at the the end of the and, end and of orient, the... and orientalism. Yeah, this might be a way to feed it back into the music book, in fact, Craig, because basically when I d drew up a sort of history of the time span of the counterculture, 1975 came across as a, so clearly on so many different historical levels as like the end. The, the one that I use in the book is you can date the counterculture from 1956, which is Ginsburg, where he first reads The Howl, to 1975, where he's, he's headlining on Bob Dylan's Rolling Thunder tour as a speaker, and he's turned into a baggage handler. Bob says, would you mind not being on the bill and actually helping move the, being a roadie, essentially? And it's like a symbolic, but at the same time, you've got the um, American withdrawal from Vietnam. Yeah. So in a way, which is that big, the bogeyman for the county cult, counterculture, which is the Vietnam War, is over. There's a book called the relaxation response, which is a version of transcendental meditation, which is sold in the uh, American market, sells millions of copies. And again, there's another book called stretching, which is basically yoga without the use of the baggage. And at that point, it, it, it's possible to talk about Orientalism because before then you have to write historically, at least in 1965, I think it was, no, I think it was earlier than that. There was, a, there was a. They, the U.S. government made it a lot easier for Eastern gurus, you know, in terms of immigration regulations. They were allowed to come up. So there was a huge raft of gurus coming from India, Japan, the Far East, coming to America, and you know, very successfully selling their selling their ideas. I mean, and a lot of them making obviously staggering amounts of money. I mean, Mahesh Maharishi Yogi made millions, billions even. So, so it, the, the way that the Eastern ideas permeated the counterculture, really, uh, until 1975, it wasn't about, it wasn't about Orientalism, because it was like there was a hunger for it, for these ideas, and also, you know, Pradupad and the, you know, the, you know, D.T. Suzuki, Mahesh Yogi, Rim Premayan, the list goes on. We're all coming to America and just making hay and musically it's a great point as well because 1975 is, is Brian Eno's discrete music which is the first completely secular version of you know minimalism up to that point minimalism and all those musics were were, were heavily wrapped up in in eastern thinking and, and Eno with discrete music just cleans it all up basically removes all that baggage, all that hippie baggage and sells the idea of, of ambient music, you know, to relax you at home, you know? So, so that's, that's my, my take on the audience. I mean, you know, I'm Sa Saeed, he makes a distinction between, he himself makes a distinction between the difference between a study on, you know, Soviet military tactics and a, a study on Pushkin's poems. So even in Saeed, there's, there's, there's shades of gray, which, which mm. gets missed over. But I just think it's so, so easy to talk about cultural appropriation in these ideas. And I just don't, looking at the history of it, I just doesn't seem fair, to be mm. honest. I, yeah, it, it kind of reminds me a bit of Bikram Chaudhary, who started the Bikram yoga, the hot yoga movement that's very popular. One of the the sort of a axioms of hot yoga is, I mean, simply you just turn up the heat in the room, you go through a series, but it's devoid of the typical smells and bells, as as it were, of, you know, the the yogi ideology. And yet you have the guru embroiled in all sorts of civil suits for philandering, you know, he had driven a Rolls Royce and just made millions upon millions of dollars doing so. And, and that side of the appropriation is not really talked about, even though he came from India himself. Yeah. But, but what you're arguing is, you know, perhaps maybe sometimes in the mid 70s, there was something more genuine anyway about this, this curiosity, you know, whether it was, you know, Indian culture, East Asian religion, Zen or what have you.
that that was more I hate to use the word authentic, but maybe not appropriative, at least in the sort of most crass yeah. sense that we ordinarily understand it. Yes, I mean that that that's coming. You know, it's. I mean, I, I could say it for you because I, you know, I wouldn't Please want you to say it. You know, <laughs> but it's. Uh, I don't think it's, it's. I think there's a definite shift in in, in mm -hmm. the and certainly that you know there was interest in the exotic trappings or whatever. But I mm -hmm. think there was a, an authentic feeling that the first certainly the first wave of people who I mean, Terry Riley is a very good example who who the the, the minimalist musician who said that you know he what people found in LSD, you know, was immediately recognizable as something that belonged to, in, in Eastern thought. And I think that obviously it's, it's, I understand it's very, you know, I'm probably more relaxed about talking about those things that, than I should be probably. Mm -hmm. But I think that there is an authentic, an attempt at universalization, an attempt to understand other people's cultures that mm -hmm. I think it's healthy. Omi K. Bahaba, I know he writes more positively about cultural exchange. I think that that is more useful, well, certainly more positive model than, than Said, which is all about, you know, you know, theft. Yeah. I, I think there's a distinction at least to be made at the level of, I, I mean, if we're thinking through the lens of Deleuze and Guattari, you know, where you live in a world of global capitalism, there's going to be this vast decoding of flows across the board, which, you know, inevitably involves components of various local cultures merging in, into others. I think the challenge is, down the line, is when those identities are made to seem solid, commodified, packaged, and so forth. And if we want to talk about, in the strictest sense, what cultural appropriation is, is the, the dominant culture appropriating the cultures, you know, the, the colonial subjects, and, and using either the artifacts, the costumes, the dispositions as a way to mock or deride those cultures. So, I, I mean, we have to parse. Yeah, yeah it's, it's part of the apparatus of control. So I think there is a, a distinction to be, to be parsed there. But I, I think I more or less come down on, on your side in the sense that there can be a, a confluence or mutual affinities that can be explored in a way that maybe are not recuperated or incorporated into the forces of normalization under the dominant global capitalist milieu. Well, let's hope so. <laughs> right. Well, with that said, I, I, I want to talk about your upcoming book. It's called The S Word, and it's Spirituality in Alternative Music is the, the subtitle of it. Is this a book that you're self-publishing? Yes, yes. I mean, I, I, I'd self-published before retreat. I'd done three books before retreat. So it's something I'm quite comfortable with. And actually I made a lot more money doing it, <laughs> self-publishing than I have made on retreat, considerably more money. Mm -hmm. And so I, and I started as a blogger. So I, I wrote from about 2003 online. I was quite used to, I have a job, I'm an, I'm an animator. So That's something I'm quite cool. used to. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I didn't really take it. I didn't take the idea around. I just, I did it, but it was a sort of a bridge to Basically, I'd come from this background of just being a music geek, essentially. And then I wrote this book on spirituality and wellness, which kind of blew my mind, the process of writing it. And I kind of definitely had a sense that I'd left the previous world that I was in. In fact, the, the analogy I often use is actually of looking through a window into the world that I was once in with mm. music. I would, I would often come across different things and I would see, hey, look, there, there that is. Mm. from where I am here. And so the, the impetus with the music book was to, was to say, okay, no, hold on a minute. The, there's a connection here with these ideas. You know, this is what these people are talking about. And immediately that, that threw up the, 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 the uh, fundamental thing, which is that there's a big kind of the S word, there's a big kind of discomfort and, you know, with the spirit, the concept of spirituality in those scenes. You know, whether it's Harold Budd saying he does, when I hear the word new age, I, you know, I reach for my revolver or, <laughs> you know, that's probably the best one I can give you. But so it was basically trying to connect the, the ideas and, and show how that these ideas are at the root of a lot of, of these musics. Right. And one of the figures that you talk about particularly is Prince, the, the artist formerly known as Prince Rogers yeah. Nelson, right? Yes. Yeah. 
And maybe you want to say a bit how you, how his life fits into that work. Sure. In fact, when people hear Prince of Spirituality, the first thing people say, oh yeah, you know, you know, oh yeah, Prince, you know, all his thing is about God and all that. But actually that's almost like a red herring. That's almost like Prince acting, the, taking the, the religious as opposed to the, the spiritual angle. But there's a whole undercurrent of, I think, I think, and, and this is what comes up a lot through the book is, is this, and it's something that Ginsburg talks about, which is basically the, the contiguousness of spirituality, mental or psychiatric conditions and psychedelic drugs. I mean, it's basically one terrain and it's, it's, it's discomfort, it's uncomfortable for people in the religious perspective, because I will see religion as being a, a method of tidying up spirituality, making spirituality safe, which is essentially a kind of this radioactive mental illness sort of situation. And again, the, so the, the religious people don't want to hear it. And, um, people who are into psychedelics don't want to hear the connections between psychedelics and mental illness and those mental spaces. But Ginsburg was great, great on it. And, and, and Prince is great as a because he is almost like the article is called the madness of Prince Rogers Nelson. And it talks about how he goes more and more and more further out into, into what you call as a philosopher, desubjectified. I would sort of say it's sort of e ego dissolution and, and it equally becomes more and more and more creative. Yeah. And then there's a kind of a, he has a meltdown. Basically he takes ecstasy and it basically blows his mojo, mm. but wrapped up in that exploration of desubjectification and, and, and psychiatric issues is, is a, also there's a gender issue, transgender yeah. issue about, which is something that's very big in the retreat in this 1960s cosmology, the whole kind of, are you a boy or are you a girl and rolling stones with long hair and, you know, Pharaoh having, you know, a boy's haircut and all that. That's just the tip of the iceberg in the sixties, but Prince goes into this whole alter sort of split personality thing where he, he was going to put out a record as Camille mm. and Camille actually comes from a book that Foucault rediscovered about the hermaphrodite called Barber. And so it's called this reminds amazing thing of, of Prince having reading Foucault and, you know, so, so, so and that's wrapped up in there too. And then he has, a, he has this called what he calls Blue Tuesday, where he takes ecstasy. It all goes to pot. Um, he sort of almost ceases, in, certainly in my view, ceases almost overnight being a, an interesting creative personality. It's kind of shut down from that point. Prince is in, very interesting from that point of view. So that's what, what I talk about. It's, it's obviously quite scary stuff, but mm. interesting. And, and with respect to our discussion, there's a really profound irony when it comes to Prince. Perhaps his most desubjectivated song, Let's Go Crazy, involves this, this image of an elevator going down to where we die when we lose control. And that yeah. is precisely how Prince died in an elevator. And it was due, I think it was due to a fentanyl overdose. Fentanyl overdose, yeah. That's a very, you know, I, I'm going to have to go back and, and put that in. So that's great. <laughs> Make sure I'm in the credits. <laughs> All right. Well, Matt, it was great talking with you. I'm going to show the book on camera. This is Retreat from Repeater Books. It's been out for a bit. And this is just like, I think what's, what's best about this book for someone like me, it, it's a great index and resource. To, to discover and, and learn about all of these countercultural movements. And then, you know, of course, encounter Matt's thread that pulls everything together. Is there anything else that you want to um, plug before we go today, Matt? No, no, I'm just very grateful for, 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 for Craig for having me both. In, and, and there was a suit. Thank you so much for your thoughts, David. That was, that was very interesting to hear that you talk about Lang in that way against Deleuze. So thank you very much. All right. All right. Have a great day, everyone. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Cheers. We appreciate your support of the imprint and the channel. Subscribe to Zero Books today on Patreon. Your material support helps us to promote a variety of perspectives on the left. Also, discover the many titles, new and old, that Zero has curated. Navigate to any of the links in the show notes to extend your support.